coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Amarachi Ubani. The headlines today. It's day 25 of the Russian invasion of Ukraine as Ukraine's president Volodymyr Zelensky calls the siege of Mariupol a war crime. The United Nations says over 900 civilians killed in Ukraine on Saturday with 10 million Ukrainians driven from their homes. Plus, Russia launches its hypersonic missile for a second day planning. We have news and reports as well as interviews coming up in this one hour. Russian officials uh, we hear today have confirmed the deputy commander of the country's Black Sea Fleet, Captain First Rank Andrei Pali, died in combat in Mariupol. A UK media had earlier reported that Ukraine claimed to have killed him. Pali's death was initially confirmed by the secretary of the, of the NICOM Naval College, Konstantin Serenko, on a Russian social network. Well, later, Russian senator from Sevastopol, the Black Sea Fleet's base in Russian Alex Crimea, said on the platform, Sevastopol has suffered a heavy, irreparable loss. Pali died in the battles for the liberation of Mariupol from the Nazis. Also, mayor of the Ukrainian capital, Vitaly Klitschko, says shelling has badly damaged 10-story housing blocks northwest of Kyiv, injuring five residents. Russian forces in Erpin, a few kilometers away, have previously fired rockets and shells at housing in the city. And then Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky today addressed the Israeli parliament, calling on Israel to give weapons to Ukraine, adding that Israel has the best air defense in the world and says Israel can definitely help our people save the lives of Ukrainians. He also asked why it has not imposed sanctions on Russia. A prior to the virtual address, he condemned the Russian strike on Mariupol City that has seen a barrage of attacks over the weeks. Ukrainian officials say the bombing of an art school sheltering 400 people is among the latest assaults in what Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky calls a terror that will be remembered for centuries to come. According to Zelensky, the blockade of Mariupol will go down in history of responsibility for war crimes. This was the message from Ukraine's president in an address late on Saturday night. The blockade of Mariupol will go down in history of responsibility for war crimes. To do this to a peaceful city, what the occupiers did to it is a terror that will be remembered for centuries to come. And the more Ukrainians tell the world about it, the more support we find, the more Russia uses terror against Ukraine, the worse the consequences will be for it. The southern port city has seen heavy bombardment by Russian forces. Many of its 400,000 occupants have been trapped for more than two weeks as Russia seeks to take the city. Controlling Mariupol will help secure a land corridor to the Crimea Peninsula that Moscow annexed from Ukraine in 2014. Alexander Bezimov escaped from his besieged city to western Ukraine with his wife and stepdaughter. You saw what happened to residential areas. Whole districts were destroyed. There is no communication there. No buildings. No one will restore it. It is a dead zone for the next 40 to 50 years or even forever. There will be a narrow strip of coastline where people live in private houses small villages. Probably some people will come to the sea, but a city of half a million residents will not be able to earn money from the beach tourism. The bombardment has left buildings in rubble and cut off central supplies of electricity, heating and water, according to local authorities. The city council said in a statement on its Telegram channel late on Saturday that several thousand residents have been taken by force to Russia. The council also said Russian forces bombed the Mariupol Art School on Saturday, in which 400 residents had taken shelter, but the number of casualties is not yet known. On Wednesday, local authorities said a theater where hundreds were sheltering was flattened by a Russian airstrike, but Russia denies hitting it. Both sides have said they will press on with peace talks despite little progress so far. Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, said on Sunday that Moscow hopes for comprehensive agreements on security issues, including Ukraine's neutral status. Moscow calls the assault on Ukraine, which began on February 24th, a special operation 
to demilitarize and denazify its neighbor. Ukraine and its Western allies call it an aggressive war of choice. As the Russian invasion in Ukraine continues, the UN's Human Rights Office says over 900 civilians have been killed in Ukraine as of March 19, adding that the real death toll is probably much higher. Ukraine's Prosecutor General's Office says 112 children have been killed. The United Nations estimates the conflict has driven 10 million Ukrainians from their homes. The UN says they had either been displaced within the country or fled abroad. In another development, a U.S. delegation led by National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan has raised directly and very clearly, it says, concerns over China's support for Russia during a meeting with Russia's top diplomat Yang Jiechi in Rome. During a press briefing earlier today, Price said backing Russia in the wake of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine would have implications for China's relations around the world, including with the U.S. allies and partners in Europe and the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, and the National Security Advisor. We are watching very closely uh, the extent to which the PRC, or, or any other country for that matter, provides any form of support, whether that's material support, whether that's economic support, whether that's financial support, uh, to Russia. Uh, any such support from anywhere in the world uh, would be of great concern to us. It would be of, uh, of course, the greatest concern uh, if a country like uh, the PRC uh, were to be doing that, a country that, by the way, uh, has tremendous leverage uh, with Russia, has a relationship with Russia that is distinct uh, from the relationship that we or just about any other country uh, on the planet has with Russia, and with that in mind, uh, could do more than probably many other countries to bring an end to this senseless violence, to this brutality, uh, to Putin's uh, premeditated uh, war of uh, choice. Uh, we have communicated very clearly to Beijing uh, that we won't stand by uh, if um, uh, we will not allow any country uh, to compensate Russia uh, for its losses. Uh, there to conclude that uh, the Russian economy is in dire straits. Uh, that has been the case ever since uh, these series of sanctions and other economic measures were instituted uh, in the, at the very outset of uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Uh, we can point to any number of metrics. I did see uh, an independent analysis uh, that Russia is on the brink of default. Uh, we know that its uh, credit rating uh, is now uh, at junk status. We know that uh, the Russian stock market uh, will be closed at least through. Back to the conflict now and for a second day running, Russia has used a hypersonic missile to target a fuel depot in Ukraine. A second consecutive day it's launched the cutting edge weapon. A strike on Saturday targeted an underground weapons facility, which Russia said was the first time it had used the advanced weaponry since the war began. Hypersonic missiles can fly in the upper atmosphere at more than five times the speed of sound. They're considered more maneuverable than conventional missiles and are more capable of avoiding interception from air defense. Russia's defense ministry said the missile used to target the arms depot in the ivano frankivsk region and the fuel depot near Mykolaiv is capable of reaching targets at a range of more than 2,000 kilometers and hitting speeds of over 6,000 kilometers per hour. Last year, Russia said it had successfully test-fired a hypersonic missile from a frigate in the White Sea off its northwestern coast. It said it aimed to include the weapon when arming Russian cruisers and submarines. And besides Russia, China, the U.S., and at least five other countries are working on hypersonic missile technology, though American research is believed to have fallen behind. Oh, much earlier, I spoke with U.S. Army veteran Major Adelika Adebayo about the impact of Russia's use of hypersonic missiles on this conflict. It's a difference maker and also changes the dynamics of how this world is being fought. Uh, and this is pretty much not new tactics. Anytime there is a conflict, especially in a proxy war that has been fought in another man's land, 
Uh, this is some of the tactics being used and mostly for the enemy, whoever the enemy is on this side, or the friendly forces as well. So this is where to see the impact of such weapons and also the, or the folks on the other side to be able to evaluate the impact of it. And from what I'm hearing, uh, it, it's living up to this expectation, at least to, to, a large, to a large extent. But it really changes the dynamics of this thing because I'm also hearing that it has the capability of, uh, at this point, say that Russia has a capability of firing missiles that have uh, nuclear warheads on it as well. So, you know, I think they are being aggressive in a sense to show that they can, you know, they're flexing their muscle, that they actually have air superiority as well. Uh, but the outcome of this has yet has been unclear, how this thing is going to be countered. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's quite, uh, it's quite disturbing. It's quite disturbing if this is actually, because it shows a different level of, uh, of warfare and how they're trying to uh, fight. Uh, if this thing is quite prolonged and protracted. So oftentimes when you use such stuff, you use for discrete, uh, very highly targeted. Oftentimes when you use such missiles, you use with GPSs, so you can actually destroy something without destroying the whole building. So oftentimes they probably want to use it to reduce collateral damage as well, but the impact of it, which I've yet to see the, uh, the collateral damage or you know, you know, those kind of uh, investigation that is being done after to see the, you know, how the disposition of those matters become. But uh, from what I've read and what I know of it, it's quite deadly. So uh, normally they want to use it to kind of, you know, re very succinct, like surgical, quite surgical in nature because it's very laser guided with GPS on it. So, uh, <laughs> you know, when you look at some of these things, you're like, wow, this is really, really getting very quite interesting. And, and, uh, and, I, and I hope, Honestly, I sincerely hope, because I know hope is not a cause of action, I sincerely hope that uh, diplomatic discussion actually prevails, because if this thing continues, uh, I don't think a Ukrainian uh, military has those kind of capability to, when they start using those kind of apostolic uh, missiles, I don't think they have the capability to kind of kind of win them off. So I don't know if those things will kind of invite the West to join in the fight. I don't think so. I think the West has been very clear uh, going forward that they can only support the military uh, weapons and aid, but not to put boots on ground. Uh, but that's yet to be seen. I know some have done logistically. They've produced troops logistically. I don't know the impact of those as well. At least in the main media, we've not seen the, uh, the impact of it. But for the most part, uh, I sincerely hope uh, cooler heads prevail. It will be quite disingenuous for anyone to believe that Russians don't know exactly what they're doing. They are quite, uh, apart from the United States and China, they are quite are very astute in their military warfare, and uh, they know exactly what they're doing, especially when it comes to military hardware. So saying that firing those missiles without, you know, unguided or whatever the names you want to use it, is quite misguided. Misguided is just... Or, yeah. It's quite, okay. I, I know exactly, I mean, you, you can call it, and I know people will say, you know, we pound into the, the, the narrative of the West, but you cannot say that those kind of weapons, especially in this age, uh, even years ago when we fought in Afghanistan, we were able to be able to succinctly actually hit a target to the 10 meters of it. So saying that the technology has really advanced, saying that is misguided or whatever they want to call it, I don't believe it. I don't really buy it either. So I, I believe they know exactly what they are doing and how those areas were targeted. You can watch more on Major Adeliki's uh, thoughts on the conflict in Ukraine as regards military weapons use on Diplomatic Channel. As tomorrow, Monday, uh, March 21st at 8.30 p.m. on Sky 518 and 11.30 p.m. on DSTV 420. Let's scoot over now to Russia, which faces deepening isolation and economic turmoil as it continues to be hit with more sanctions effective, effectively cut off a country's major financial institutions from Western markets. Russia has been cut from SWIFT, a global financial messaging system used every day to route billions of dollars among more than 11,000 banks and other financial institutions around the world. The U.S. has imposed limits on exports of technology as semiconductors to Russia, with allies in Europe and Japan joining the move. There have been energy sanctions, aerospace closures to Russian airlines, sanctions on Russian oligarchs and many others. How are Nigerians in Russia coping with the sanctions and what do they think about the conflict in Ukraine? Well, providing us a window into these is Chairman, Nigerians in Diaspora Organization Russia, Oem Sampson. Oem, thank you for joining me this evening. Thank you. How is the conflict in Ukraine being reported in Russia? 
Um, I think we are seeing uh, the whole picture of the uh, unfortunate, very, very unfortunate events because we, um, Russia and Ukraine, uh, just like brothers and sisters, they speak almost the same, they speak the same language in most cases. Uh, most of the Ukrainians, they speak Russian and many Russians have their uh, relatives, friends and uh, colleagues in Ukraine. So. Uh, this is a very, very unfortunate event because nobody even uh, assumed or imagined that this could have happened. But uh, now that we are in it, we only hope for uh, a diplomatic solution uh, to it. So what are you hearing on the news? How is Russia reporting the conflict in Ukraine? Uh, actually, the Russian Defense Ministry uh, daily, on a daily basis, uh, give a report on the uh, successes or the advancement of the uh, Russian military in Ukraine. And um, from what we are able to observe, we understand that we need to be very, very careful uh, with how we interpret the information that we see, because one and the same uh, picture of uh, videos are interpreted differently depending on where you look at it. So we just try to stay out of the conflict itself and focus on how we can help to get the Nigerians that are trapped in the Ukraine out and how we can deal with the impact that it is having on Nigerians that are living in Russia. Well, let's talk more about Nigerians living in Russia. Um, as you have uh, rightly mentioned, you're in Moscow now. So when we talk about these sanctions that have been imposed by countries like the United States um, with allies in the European Union and NATO countries inclusive, are they impactful on Nigerians who are living in Russia? Have you been affected by them? Indirectly, yes. Uh, because uh, Nigerians who have businesses have uh, seen a uh, slowdown in the businesses. Uh, some have reported a slowdown of up to 40% uh, in their businesses. Um, but it's definitely going to have an impact because uh, Russia is not, money is not able to move uh, as smoothly and freely as it was moving before. Like, for example, MasterCard and uh, Visa have stopped their international operation. So if you have a Visa or MasterCard, uh, the card only work inside Russia. The moment you get out of the shores of Russia, the card is no longer working. Or if you have a card that is that a Master or Visa card that was issued uh, outside Russia, when you get into Russia, you cannot use this card. So that really uh, affects the... Uh, movement of money for even uh, individuals. On uh, the business level, especially for those who do an international business, they have seen uh, um, like a huge um, slowdown in the movement of money. Actually, SWIFT has been closed, but not every bank is included in the list of the SWIFT that has been closed. Some Russian banks are still able to operate because some kind of businesses still needs to go on and it has been selective. So only the Russian uh, big banks uh, are suffering from the SWIFT. Uh, most banks are still functioning and the international banks in Russia that are operating, they are still functioning well. So how are you able to bypass, you know, the restrictions in some of these financial institutions? I think uh, though the sanctions that have been imposed um, has been imposed for businesses to somehow get their way through. Because I think that this, because if SWIFT was, uh, uh, if the SWIFT was general on all the banks, then uh, the uh, financial transactions would have been closed. But there are selected banks that SWIFT uh, has been um, that they cannot use SWIFT. So some other banks can use it. So businesses can just move from one bank to the other and they still can function. Uh, the stock market has suffered a lot and that's why it has been uh, closed. And the currency has lost, uh, lost uh, about 35% of its value at the beginning, but it's now recovering. 
uh, the loss is now at about uh, 27 percent uh, compared to the value that it was about a month ago. But the problem with businesses are that when you don't know the value of the currency, then it's difficult to make transactions, especially transactions that take long time to com uh, long time to complete. What about normal everyday, um, you know, transactions that you have to make? Uh, for example, I know that a lot of businesses, international businesses, have packed up and left, um, leaving their assets behind. Um, how how are you know how are you you guys in in Moscow? How are you able to, um, you know, make your purchases and so on uh, from what you're used to? Yeah, um, I especially have been moving around to see uh, if there is something really different from what has been before. Uh, but I tell you that when you go to the shops or when you move around the city, you don't see any difference from what was a month ago and what is now. Um, all the shops have the same uh, goods that were in there before, but the only difference is that uh, some Russians try to buy more and keep a stock just in case. But the shops are uh, continuously re replenishing uh, the goods in the, in the store. So um, if you do not watch the TV and you just move around the city, you will not see uh, most Russian cities, except the ones uh, at the border with Ukraine, uh, where the flights has been, uh, that flight zone has been, uh, no flight zone has been placed. Uh, when you move around many Russian cities, which I have been doing for the past week, um, you do not see any difference at all, comparatively. Finally, as, as chairman of Nigerians and Diaspora Organization in Russia, what are you telling members about the current crisis going on between Russia and Ukraine? Um, we do not want to get into the, uh, discussing the crisis itself because we do not have uh, enough information that can uh, make us to understand uh, what exactly the crisis is all about. All we try to look at is the impact on the Nigerians and uh, the opportunities that still exist and how we can continue to hold on to our bilateral relations uh, with, uh, with Russia. And um, that's how the life can continue because uh, mostly the Nigerians do not feel it except for the financial restrictions. Because, for example, students... Um, students who are um, private students who have to pay school fees, um, they are having difficulties uh, receiving the money to Russia uh, to pay their fees and may be expelled. That was the reason why we were holding a meeting yesterday to see how we can resol resolve that issue together with the Nigerian embassy here in Moscow. Um, and just this kind of uh, technical issues uh, what we're trying to deal with to see how we can adapt the solution, uh, where, where we can find a solution uh, to adapt ourselves to uh, the current situation because we understand that uh, this situation is not going to go away tomorrow. And so we have to do something so that uh, the students do not lose their future because of the conflict that they know no nothing about. What, what, what are you doing to help them? Uh, the embassy is doing a lot to, to, to help them. Those, what we do as NATO is to raise the awareness uh, for, uh, for us to understand. And we are talking uh, to the schools where they are studying, and the Russians have promised not to expel uh, anyone this year. And uh, apart from that, uh, as I understood, the Russian uh, Minister of Education has uh, promised to give a scholarship to uh, Nigerian students who may be willing to come from the Ukraine to Russia uh, to continue their education also. So uh, the Nigerian embassy is working really, really hard in this direction, and we're just helping to make things happen in this direction. And uh, we're trying to raise the awareness so that uh, the students will know that some opportunities are available because sometimes, sometimes if you don't get this information out, then people just don't know about some of the opportunities that are available. Owem Samson, thank you for enlightening us this evening.
Thank you very much. Thank you. At this video you're about to watch happen today, residents of the Ukrainian city of Kherson chanting, go home to Russian forces, as they confront two military vehicles with Russian markings. In a video obtained by Reuters, demonstrators could be seen marching along Oshkova Avenue towards two oncoming military vehicles painted in a Z symbol, heavily associated with the Russian military. Buildings and shops along the avenue matched those seen on Google satellite imagery, as well as file images of the area. Following the confrontation by the protesters, some wearing Ukrainian flags, the vehicles turned around and left the immediate area. Ukrainian authorities said on Saturday they had not seen any significant shifts over the past 24 hours in frontline areas, with fighting between Ukrainian and Russian forces continuing in the Black Sea port city, Kherson. Russia has said it now controls the Kherson region. Staying in Kherson, more Africans are still in the city awaiting evacuation from their governments. The Nigerian government said last week it was discussing with Russian authorities on a safe corridor for evacuations. And according to the Nigerian ambassador to Russia, details are still being worked on. Now, as we said, African students have been stuck in the city since the invasion, with hope fading on government evacuation. I want to bring in Ryan Ng. He's a Cameroonian studying to become a sailor in Kherson. Ryan, thank you for joining me tonight. You're welcome. Thank you. How are you today? What have, what have you been going through the past few days in Kherson? Well, actually, today I'm, I'm fine. For the past, like, 21 days now, we have been going through a lot. A lot has been going on, you know, since the war started on the 24th of February. And this the city was captured. The city was captured, I think, on the um, I think on the second of March. So there was no way for us to escape before then because there was fighting going on along the road leading out of the city. So since the city was captured, we have been home every day, trying to go out to get food, but it's difficult to get um, food stuff because um, all, everywhere you go, every, every place is closed. So we have been living for the past three weeks now in struggle. Mm. Uh, Ryan, you'll notice that we haven't put up your video, and that's because we see that you are moving around and you actually haven't uh, set up properly, so we'll just continue with the voice conversation until you do that. As supplies, we understand, are running low in Kherson. How are you coping with groceries and so on? Sorry, sorry, come again. My, uh, I can't hear you. Clearly. Sorry, because it's you speak. I can't hear you clearly. Yeah, uh, come again. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to speak slower. Um, we're trying to get a video off you. I see that the video is on, uh, but you're not properly set up yet. So we'll allow you to do that while we continue, you know, the conversation still. We can hear you. Um, we know that supplies, uh, groceries and stuff like that are all running low. How are you coping with yeah. uh, all of that? Yeah, actually the city, is, uh, the city has run out of uh, grocery supplies. The city has been blocked. They can't. Uh, yesterday, actually, um, the government of Ukraine sent in about 14 tons, uh, no, sorry, 140 tons of food supply, but it was blocked. And it, the Russian troops blocked the convoys from uh, to enter the, the town of Kherson, and it was sent back. So, but right now, the population is in panic. There's not, all the pharmacies, I think they have shot, they are in short of drugs. But the Russians, they have their own humanitarian con, um, convoy too. So they have been trying to give out some, some to people. But Ukrainians don't want to take um, Russian humanitarian aid. Why is that? Why don't they want the humanitarian uh, supplies from, from Russia? 
because they would the Russians will use it as propaganda. Like they will show they will they will produce the image to Russia that they are the liberators. They, they came to like to the, to this to the city to come and liberate them from suffering. So that's why they don't they don't want to take it. It's, it will be like a propaganda. So, um, Ryan, we do have, you know, a rough sense of how many Nigerians are there in Ukraine. We know that just, a, a, you know, there's a sizable number of Nigerians who are there. It's the first time I'm hearing that there, there are Cameroons, Cameroonians also amongst them. How many of you are there, um, you know, clustered together as you await any, any opportunities to evacuate the city? Yeah, actually, um, last week we were about um, 100 plus. I can't, I don't really know the exact numbers, but we are in, in the city. Uh, to get to everyone is not difficult. We could just give a phone call and say, let's meet at city center, and everybody will be there. There are about, um, let's see, I don't really know the exact numbers of Nigerians, but they are close to, let's say, what about Cameroonians? Or maybe more. Okay, great. Cameroonians are about 20, uh, 20 or something. 20, yeah. And you're all in the same um, school? They, no, no, not the same okay. school. Some of uh, some of them are, are in uh, the technical university, Agrinian University and the Maritime University. And some of them are finished studies and they have family. Well, interesting. And has there been any correspondence between you and your government regarding your evacuation or your well-being? You mean the Ukrainian government? No, I mean the Cameroonian government. Yeah, actually, yeah, we have been uh, we have been in touch with uh, our government. They tried to uh, send um, a bus here to evacuate. Everybody, not only Cameroonians, everybody. But the problem is that everyone is scared to come into the city, to drive into the city, because we have seen many videos that uh, this, the Russian soldiers they just shoot at cars randomly. So everyone is scared. Have you attempted going out on your own um, to try yeah. to leave the city? Yes, we tried. Uh, we tried that. It was possible to leave, but we tried it. Uh, we arrived at the post where the Russian soldiers were. They verified our document. They put, they asked where are we going. We told them where we are going, and they said no, we should not go because it is dangerous where we are going. So they advised us to turn back. And they also proposed that if we want evacuation, they could evacuate us to Crimea. Crimea is uh, a Russian territory, a disputed Russian territory here in, in Ukraine. And you're not willing to go to Crimea? Yeah, because according to the law of Ukraine, you can, you can go to Crimea only with special permission from the Ukrainian government. If you go there without a permission, you will automatically deported and you are given 10 years entry ban into Ukraine. Oh, those are pretty interesting uh, laws. So, you know, as we await, you know, any move, uh, possibly a humanitarian corridor opening sometime soon, hopefully this week, uh, for your evacuation, are you also thinking about your future? What's going to happen? Yeah. I know you're your final year, so what's going to happen to, you know, the rest of your studies? Uh, actually, uh, right right now, we are... We are we are going half time to think about that. We just like we have been stuck here for close to four weeks now. We have been depressed. We just think what we do. We don't know when uh, when this war will be over. How the situation in the country will be. So we are just checking on our options. But we just want to be evacuated to go to somewhere calm where you can like um, um, relax and think of the next move. If you maybe, some of us want to study uh, maybe to other countries or maybe come back here when things are more stable. You are seriously considering coming back. Um, what hopes are there, you know, that your school or your institution will still be standing at the end of this war? Uh, that is what we don't know now. Nobody knows if uh, what what's going to happen because 
the school building is still intact. Um, nothing has been destroyed. Everything has been intact. But uh, they don't know if this Kherson city will be given back to Ukraine or will be taken uh, over by the, the uh, by the Russian. So nobody knows anything. But in the meantime, uh, Ryan, you know, um, basic infrastructure is still running. You still have water. You still have electricity. You still have, you know, uh, the internet. You're able to communicate with family members. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah, just of recently, we had that. But um, like um, two weeks ago, uh, the internet was cut off. They usually regulate uh, when they cut it off the whole day and they give it, they put it back one hour but we have running water heater electricity yeah in the, in the set in the city but in the villages and towns surrounding the city uh there's no electricity water or internet so i can say we are fortunate and what are you telling your folks back home in cameroon and your friends who are concerned about your well-being what are you telling them well, first of all, uh, we, um, when they call, we just, uh, I just try to assure, I just make them know that I am alive, thank God. And they ask asking why are you still here? And we try to explain the situation that uh, the city is under control by the military and all roads leading out to the city is being occupied and it's very dangerous to, and risky to go out. So I just I'm telling them that we are waiting for an official corridor when they will announce it for evacuation of foreigners because um, um, the Ukrainian government and an African government and some other NGOs they are aware that um, there are some foreigners who are in case on have been stranded all this while. Well, Ryan, hang in there. I know that um, your hope might be fading a little, but there is hope still, you know, that you will be evacuated. I'm sure of it. Um, the governments are working around the clock to ensure your evacuation, as well as other Africans who are stuck in Kherson. Thank you for speaking with yeah. us, and we wish you all of the best. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ryan NG in Kherson. In other developments, British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says it would be a mistake to normalize relations with President Vladimir Putin of Russia following the invasion of Ukraine. He was speaking at a Conservative Party conference where he said to try to re-normalize relations with Putin as was done in 2014 would be to make exactly the same mistake again. To applause from delegates, Johnson said bold steps needed to be taken to end dependence on Russian gas and oil. In Ukraine and the end of freedom in Ukraine will mean... A victorious Putin will not stop in Ukraine, and the end of freedom in Ukraine will mean the extinction of any hope of freedom in Georgia and then Moldova. It will mean the beginning of a new age of intimidation across the whole of Eastern Europe, from the Baltic to the Black Sea. And if Putin succeeds in crushing Ukraine, it will be the green light for autocrats everywhere in the Middle East, in the Far East. This is a turning point for the world. And it's a moment of choice. It's a choice between freedom and oppression. And I know there are some around the world, even in some Western governments, who invoke what they call real politique, and who say that we're better off making accommodations with tyranny. I have to say I believe they are profoundly wrong. And that to try to re-normalize relations with Putin after this, as we did in 2014, would be to make exactly the same mistake again. And uh, we must take the bold steps necessary to end our dependence on Putin's oil and gas. And that is what... That is what we are doing. In the immortal phrase, it is time to take back control of our energy supplies. After, 
After years of short-termism and hand-to-mouth solutions, we are setting out a British energy security strategy. And we will make better use of our own naturally occurring hydrocarbons rather than import them top dollar from abroad and put the money into Putin's bank account. When we're facing a tyrant like Vladimir Putin, the only thing he understands is strength. We need to stand up for our societies and we must never let our guard down again. Our new trade and security deals are with our allies, not our opponents. That's why AUKUS is so important, helping our Australian friends acquire the nuclear submarines they need to defend their territory. That's why NATO is so important, and it's why we're strengthening it for a new era. The UK is the biggest European spender in NATO, and we're building up our support, our troops in Estonia and Poland. 21-year-old Ukrainian Alina Zverkolhilib, who studies in Canada, was home in Ukraine on vacation on the day Russia invaded her country. Now she's among crowds of refugees at the Polish border. as She heads back to Canada, having fled her home country. Now, on Saturday, the sociology student was one of many Ukrainians who made their way across the border into Poland as refugees. She says despite everything, she was happy she had managed to get back to Ukraine to see her parents and when asked about a future she had only one thing in mind. Kiev and like compared to my city it was terrible. I, in uh, February 24 I was so like at home with my parents and uh, I just started to receive like thousands of messages from my friends and my parents woke me up and say they told me that war start and I was like I couldn't believe in that like I was like are you kidding like really? And yeah, it was terrible to hear. And then we just, it was a terrible day. We were just watching news. My brother is living in Kiev. And my brother said he's going to go by car to the west to cross the border. And I, I took a train to the Kiev. And like compared to my city, it was terrible. I just arrived there and I could hear a bomb. I got, we just came to his house. Uh, my future, I don't know. I like. I am actually studying in Canada, so I honestly I just arrived in Ukraine for vacation to see my parents. Just you know, and actually I'm kind of really glad that I could go here, even though it's like it's real terrible right now. But at least I could see my parents because I don't know what's gonna be. And for the future, I don't know. I just honestly everything I'm worried about is just to. Uh, for my parents to be safe, and I feel safe here. Like. Now to the personal story of the 1941 Leningrad siege survivor who is stuck in another war. A lifetime ago, and almost 870 miles away, Margarita Morozova lived through the World War, a second World War, that is, uh, the siege of Leningrad. Now the 87-year-old says she finds herself once more in a city under attack. A long time ago and 1,400 kilometers away, Margarita Morozova lived through the World War II siege of Leningrad. Now the 87-year-old Ukrainian finds herself once more in a city under attack. The retail librarian lives in Kokiv, a Ukrainian city of 1.5 million people that lies 25 kilometers from the Russian border that's been barraged by Russian air and rocket strikes that have reduced many buildings to rubble. I could never imagine that a new war would start in my old age, in my worst nightmare. I cannot even imagine that such massacre will be repeated. It is horrible. We've been living in Ukraine for almost 60 years. When we came here, it was so good here. Morozova was just seven years old in 1941 when German forces began the siege of the Soviet city of Leningrad in Russia, now known as St. Petersburg, where about 1.5 million people died during the two years of blockage. She says she still has vivid memories of the Nazi bombardment after she and her mother missed the ferry out of the port, only to watch with horror as the boat was then destroyed by shells. After the war, she moved to Kharkiv in Ukraine where she has lived for the last 60 years. 
and where she now finds unmistakable echoes of her past. In my childhood, I hid from bombardments in the corridor. I took shelter in old buildings, and it is the same now. Once shelling of Kharkiv begins, when air raid siren is on, we go to the corridor. We don't know if it will protect us or not. It is very terrifying when young people die, when beautiful buildings collapse. Earlier this week, the mayor of Kharkiv said the city had been under constant attack by Russian forces. Russia refers to the invasion as a special military operation and says its forces do not target civilians. We saw war and we know what it is like. I want the war to be over. I want them to leave Ukraine in peace. Ukraine is an independent country. So what are they doing here? Courts in a conflict between the land of her birth and the land where she lives now, Brozova believes it will be a disaster for both sides. It is a disaster for the Russian people too. Their children are dying for nothing. I'm asking, what for? During the Great Patriotic War, fine, it was clear we fought fascists, different people. While here, they're friendly people. We have common and close cultures. The languages are close. How is it possible that this has happened? It's very dreadful. Kharkiv, an engineering and a transport hub, is no stranger to war. During World War II, it was fought over by German and Russian forces and changed hands several times. A Pope Francis continues his implicit criticism on Russia. Today, he called the conflicts in Ukraine an unjustified senseless massacre, urging leaders to stop the war. About 30,000 people attended his weekly Sunday address and blessing in St. Peter's Square. Pope Francis said there was no justification for this in his latest strong, latest strong condemnation of the war, which has so far avoided mentioning Russia by name. And as we have the program, leading performers from across the world, including Russia and Ukraine, took part in the sellout dance for Ukraine charity gala at the London Coliseum Theatre on Saturday. Organisers said tickets sold out in less than 48 hours, and the event had already raised at least £140,000 for the Disasters Emergency Committee's Ukraine appeal. The event was the brainchild of former royal ballet dancer, uh, ballet stars Ivan Putrov from Ukraine and Romanian Alina Hoyokaru. The event brought together a diverse range of performers who donated their services. Some audience members were draped with the Ukrainian flag for the event and the stage was lit in shades of yellow. That's another program. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani.